Welcome back to Module 2. In this section 2.2, we're going to be continuing our discussion of moon phases and really getting into the depth that we want to for our course, having introduced some of the basics in the previous section. So let's get started. We had this question in the previous video, and if it's been a little bit of time since you saw that one, I want you to go ahead and pause and read through the options and see which one you'd pick. All right, now I want you to recognize if you have changed your answer from the previous time that I asked this question at the start of section 2.1 or not. Um, and what I really want you to check is, did you pick option two again, kind of having not really come to terms with this uh, way of describing the phases of the moon and the way of understanding what shapes are possible and what shapes are not. What I also want to note here is uh, option two, Earth's shadow covering different parts of the moon. That happens during lunar eclipses, which is going to be the focus of um, one of the focus points of our next video. Um, but it is not the cause of monthly changes to the moon phases. Very common misconception and one that we absolutely have to confront ourselves and change our own minds about to really make sure that we understand this topic. The answer is still option four, our view of the half illuminated moon. It's half lit up from sunlight, uh, and sometimes we see the whole daytime side of the moon and we call it a full moon, sometimes we only see part of it, and that changes throughout the moon's orbit. All right, so let's get into the details of being able to talk about the lengths of time that the moon is in different phase names and how we can predict what times of day we will see moonrise and moonset, because that's really going to um, have us think deeper about this topic in a way that we need for our college level course uh, beyond what we might have learned uh, briefly in a previous science class. Now we're going to be looking at different diagrams both here and in the previous Deeper Look video and uh, on our own when we're drawing things. And we will try to be a little bit consistent by having sunlight come in from the right side of our page. So it's not drawn here, but by naming uh, on this slide, noon, sunrise, uh, midnight, sunset, those different terms, we have by definition put the sunlight coming in from the right side of the page, which is why the earth that's drawn here is lit up uh, on the right side and it's dark on the left side. Okay, now let's talk about these times of day uh, briefly. So noon would be when we are directly facing the direction of the sun. So if we were standing uh, on the earth along that line that says noon, the sun would be as high as it's going to get in our sky. It would only be directly overhead if we were standing right at the earth's equator. This diagram is going to be looking from the north pole of the earth down onto the earth. Uh, and so as the earth rotates, when we are looking from the North Pole down, like this diagram is indicating, uh, the Earth in real life in three-dimensional space rotates counterclockwise. So by telling you that, you don't have to memorize it, by telling you that direction, uh, as we were standing at noon on Earth, time is passing for us as the Earth rotates. And when we go from the daytime side to the nighttime side, we're experiencing sunset. So I hope that that makes sense when we see that, uh, that cutoff between the light and the dark parts of the Earth surface in this diagram. As we continue to let time pass, midnight would be the middle of the dark side of the Earth. We're in the middle of the night. And sunrise is going to be by definition when we go from nighttime to daytime on our way back towards day uh, at the bottom of this diagram. Now, the reason why I spend time stopping and talking about this diagram is because it's going to be a part of a much larger and more complicated looking diagram on this slide. And I want you to recognize that you can draw your own diagram that has less stuff going on, less words, less labeling, uh, so that it is exactly the level of specificity that you'll find useful when going through all of this. So if you want to pause and draw the parts of this uh, diagram that make the most sense to you in your notebook before continuing, that's a great idea. Um, and I really do want you to be able to draw this diagram. You don't have to do it from memory, but once you have an understanding of the moon phase names, it will make sense to you why we put new moon and first quarter and so on in the different places that we do. Now what I want us to think about um, when we're looking at a diagram like this 
is what it would mean to see a moon phase at a particular time of day. So let's say that we want to look at a waxing gibbous moon and we want to see it when it is high in the sky. We want to note a couple of things. First of all, when we are looking at any of these moon phases as drawn on the slide or in your notes, the right side is lit up because that's where the sunlight's coming from and the dark side um, is dark because it's not receiving sunlight. And that is what it looks like from space, the space view. But if we want to think about where we are looking when we're standing on the ground on Earth looking at one of these um, moons, we can draw an arrow pointing our perspective, our point of view for the moon. So for this example, when I've chosen waxing gibbous here, me standing and seeing it as high as it's going to get in the sky would be a person who is experiencing a time of day after sunset, but before midnight. So like 9 p.m., I would be seeing a waxing gibbous moon as high as it's going to get in the sky, like along the meridian. And to confirm that I understand what it will look like, we cover up the back half of the moon, the far side of the moon, because we can't see it from Earth. And if we look now, that waxing gibbous moon is going to be lit up a whole bunch on the right side, and there will be a small part of it that is dark and therefore not visible. That matches our expectation of waxing gibbous from diagrams that we'll see in the textbook and in the previous lecture video. You could do this for any time of day and figure out what is highest in the sky at that point. And I encourage you to go through that process on your own so that it makes sense to you these rise times, set times, and highest points for these different moon phases. I'm not going to say all these terms out loud. This is a diagram that you can choose to put in your notes or not put in your notes. I'm not asking you to memorize it. Uh, but if we were to draw the... Um, earth moon system, it would make sense to us after practicing when it first comes into view, when it's highest in the sky, and when it sets. So these can be useful um, benchmarks for us. So for example, if we have a waning crescent moon, we know that the times are going to be something in between the third quarter times and the new moon times. Okay. So again, you can um, refer back to this in the posted slides, you can pause the video to write it down, whatever works best for your um, understanding. And one thing I want to stop and talk about briefly is a reminder that all of the changes we're talking about are smooth and consistent. We don't go from a new moon to like a perfect halfway in between um, crescent moon overnight. Every single moment in time, things are slowly, slowly shifting, and we have special terms for the extremes. So the extremes of the year are the winter solstice and the summer solstice. The extremes for the month are the new moon and the full moon. And the extremes for a day are midnight and noon. And what I want us to make sure we understand is that um, throughout the different seasons, we already talked about in a previous video, that the length of a the daylight that we receive um, living in Grand Rapids, for example, changes drastically from summer when we might have 15 hours of daylight to winter when we might only have nine hours of daylight. But for the purposes of our discussion, we're going to kind of average over the course of the year and we're going to kind of imagine for ourselves that it takes six hours to get from midnight to sunrise, six more to get from sunrise to noon, six more to get from noon to sunset. Kind of make it easy for us because we are focused on a different topic and we want to just kind of smooth it out that on average that is going to be true uh, as long as we take all of the different days of the year and just smooth it out all out. And like um, we have terms for this big chunk of time in between these special points, all of the time from sunrise to noon, for example, six hours worth of time, we would call the morning. Um, and, you know, we might not all agree on the definition of afternoon versus evening, but just a term to be able to point out um, for each of these six hour chunks of time. But one thing I want to make sure that we feel confident on is no matter what time of day it is on our clocks, no matter what part of the year that we're in, if a moon phase rises at sunset, like the full moon does, or it's highest um, in the sky at sunset, like the first quarter moon is, that is true actual sunset. Because what 
truly matters in moon phases is where is the sun. And if it's right on the horizon, that is where we can be 90 degrees away um, along the circle or halfway around the circle uh, for putting the moon. So we'll be exploring that uh, over the course of this video as well. All right, so by working with these different uh, time points in the diagrams that we can make, we can start to think about planning ahead, either planning ahead several hours or planning ahead several days. So these are photographs. I took both of these pictures um, when I was on my honeymoon in Italy uh, with my new husband. And um, he and I were looking at beautiful Italian sites, but we were also looking at the moon because we're both nerds. And uh, on the left here, I am showing you a picture from October 17th, near the start of our honeymoon. Um, and it's a picture at 7 p.m. So that time of year, uh, it has gotten dark already in Italy uh, by 7 p.m. And on the left here, we can see a moon that is less than half a circle, and it's lit up on the right. Now, one thing I want you to understand is that we can really easily tell the difference between waxing and waning moons based on what side they are lit up. Uh, we saw this briefly when I talked about covering up the back side of the moon uh, in that bigger diagram. And if we look through our notes at any other pictures we've made, all of the waxing phases are lit up on the right side, and all of the waning phases are lit up on the left side. The moon gets um, lit up from right to left, and it gets dark from right to left also. So on the left, I am going to tell you, in case we didn't feel confident, that this is a waxing crescent moon. It is waxing because it's lit up on the right side, and it's a crescent because that is the name of the shape that we see. So before we get into the, the weeds here, my goal for you right now is to determine what date this second picture would be taken. Is it one day apart? Is it two days apart? Is it 12 days apart? Uh, and I want you to make an estimate. I want you to pause the video and make an estimate of what date we are looking at for this moon here on the right side. Take your time and uh, try not to look back at too many of your notes, but make an kind of initial guess, and then you can describe for yourself what you would want to look at to, uh, to determine that for sure. And as you think about what date that would be, you're going to have to realize that we need to know what to call this phase name. We need to know if we are seeing a waxing or waning moon, depending on what side it's lit up, and what shape uh, we would describe this as. More than half a circle, we know that there's a term for that. So all of the questions on the slide, uh, both the bullet points and the highlighted one, I want you to pause now and think about all of those questions because you may have started to think about some of them already anyway. So pause the video and think for as long as you need to. Okay, so the phase name is what we're going to answer first. We'll get back to the date in just a second. Um, the phase that we're looking at is a waxing gibbous moon. It's more than half lit up, and it's lit up on the right side. Uh, I took these photos in Italy, but one thing that we want to recognize is that the entire globe has the same phase name on any given day. When we're talking about Italy versus Michigan, those are both still places in the Northern Hemisphere. They're both, both going to see the moon look like this. If you took the same picture uh, in Michigan on this same future date, something somewhere in October 2015, you would have seen the moon look exactly like this. If we were instead near the equator or in the Southern Hemisphere, the important part to recognize is everyone would still be calling it a waxing gibbous moon because over the course of the next few days, it would be getting more illuminated and it would be leading us towards full moon. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it would look turned around. So our simple analogy or our simple model of saying the right side being lit up is waxing works for the Northern Hemisphere, but not the Southern Hemisphere. We'd have it backwards there. But it's a waxing gibbous moon, and because, let's go back a bit, we are looking at a waxing crescent moon to waxing gibbous, 
If we think about our diagram, that's about a quarter of a cycle. We have a pretty chunky waxing crescent. We have a not really full circle um, gibbous. So about a week seems reasonable. So if we tacked on seven days to that, it would be October um, 24th. So that's going to be our estimate there. And we have a question at the end. Can we see any phases of the moon during the day? Hopefully you answered yes. And in fact, I'm going to show you that uh, I saw the exact same moon two hours earlier. So our estimate was October 24th. October 23rd is just as good. I'm not expecting us to get this perfectly right with estimates like this. We are looking at a waxing gibbous moon, and you can absolutely see the moon during the day. It's just harder to notice. If we were outside um, at both of these time points, whether we're talking about Italy or Michigan, we would see the moon in the sky above the horizon before sunset in this left picture, but we would have to kind of be looking for it to find it because it is not a very high contrast object when the sky is lit up bright. In contrast, on the right side, that beautiful bright waxing gibbous moon, once the sun has set, will be the brightest object in the sky. We'll notice it out of the corner of our eye, even if we weren't expecting to look for it. That's why people tend to get this misconception that the moon is only out during nighttime, because that's when they remember seeing it most often. But I would strongly encourage you to start to look for the moon at the appropriate times of day, based on our learning that we're going to be gathering over this, um, this topic, and start to realize that when we count up hour by hour how much time the moon spends above the horizon um, during the daytime versus above the horizon during the nighttime, it's about half and half. Half of the entire month, the moon is above the horizon during the day, and half of the time during the month, it's above the horizon during the night. So we don't want to think of it as sun means day and moon means night, because that is a real misconception that's going to hurt our ability to look for the moon appropriately. All right, so thinking about where to look for different moon phases really hits home this critical thinking of can I draw a diagram that's going to help me picture this? So I'd like you to try this. Uh, I want you to think about where you would look to see a first quarter moon when it is rising. And there's multiple parts to that question. Uh, to break it down, we'll talk about a couple different things. But I want you to try with your kind of current understanding, your current confidence level uh, to answer this. So pause and answer the first question. Uh, you can get to the second question if you feel really confident, um, but we'll talk about it together uh, afterwards. Okay, I hope you paused because this really is a chance for you to get a sense of um, your critical thinking, your confidence level, all that kind of thing. So, really important for us. This first question really doesn't actually require any understanding of moon phases. This first question, where would you look to see a first quarter moon as it rises? It is so important for us to keep in mind the big picture. Stuff rises into our view because the earth is rotating. No matter what phase I asked you about, if I'm asking you about the object that's rising, it is rising on the eastern horizon, somewhere along the eastern horizon, maybe northeast, maybe southeast, but it's anything that rises, rises on the eastern half of the sky, Anything that sets will set on the western half of the sky. So if we got tricked or if we were thinking way too hard or way too complicated about this, I want you to take a step back and remember to think about these big picture ideas that we've learned about in module one, about what's causing things to come into view and um, leave our view. So the first answer here is two. Um, and then for asking where the sun is, that is the multiple parts that we have to think about. So a first quarter moon, when it rises, when it comes into view, we can kind of picture it, we might maybe draw ourselves a little sketch in our notes, it is lit up on the right side. So as it comes into view on the eastern part of the horizon, it's lit up on the right side, which means the sun has to be over in the sky to its right. That means it would be in the southern sky. The sun would be in the southern sky. So the first question, the answer is two. The moon would be on the eastern horizon. And that bottom question that's bolded here, the answer would be four. The sun would be in the southern sky along the meridian um, at its highest point. 
a first quarter moon is going to be rising at noon, and we did not have to look up that table of numbers and dates uh, and times to be able to answer that. Okay, let's think about a couple more things. So another question for us to really, again, be building these critical thinking skills. This is an open question because you can answer um, as few or as many phases as you think will work here. But we want to figure out if we were trying to look for the moon every single night over the course of a month, an hour before sunrise, what phases would we catch? So think through that question, pause for as long as you need to. All right, so one of the ways that you can use a diagram like this, the one that's on the slide, but maybe one that you drew in your notes, is to cover up with your hand or a piece of paper um, everything that is uh, beneath a person's feet if they are standing an hour before sunrise. So the arrow, the yellow arrow, is indicating where we would be if we're talking about an hour before sunrise. Just kind of an estimate. And just cover up all of it that's beneath our feet. And now all of the things that we can see include waxing gibbous. The term's gone, but we can see that we would be able to see the moon before it becomes a full moon. So a waxing gibbous, full moon, waning gibbous, third quarter, and a waning crescent moon. We would not see a first quarter moon. We would not see a waxing crescent moon, not at that time of day. We would have to be looking at a different time of day to see those. If you struggle with any of these questions, make a clear comment to yourself in your notes on what you struggled with and then follow up with me because I would love to help work with you to think about this in a different way or draw it out in a way that works for your brain uh, because everybody's brains work differently and I'm just trying to help us build these skills by asking lots of different questions to really help us think deeper. All right, so we're going to try another way of uh, understanding where we are and what we're thinking for seeing the moon in the sky. So one of the things I said that we wanted to be able to do, ideally, is if we see the moon in the sky, figuring out what time of day it is, or what time, yeah, what time of day it is, or night. So here's an example. We see the moon, it is in the southwest sky, so that means it's past the meridian, it is past its highest point, and it's a full moon. So that white circle means it's all lit up, it's a full moon. So for us to be able to answer this question, there's a couple of steps that should happen. So let's practice to see what those look like. I'm going to go through those steps for you with this example, and then I'm going to ask you to think about the a second example. So the first thing we're going to do is draw the whole path of the moon and the sun through the sky. And what I mean by that is we know that the moon and the sun rise somewhere in the east, they go through um, the meridian in the southern sky, they set in the west, and then they have to go under the horizon and finish a circle that's kind of tilted, right? We're trying to draw a three-dimensional system on a 2D piece of paper. So it's going to be tilted a little bit. Looks like an oval because it's tilted. Now, that was step one just drawing that oval. Step two is based on how lit up the moon is, we want to draw on that oval where the sun is going to be. If we're talking about a new moon, the sun would be in the same location. If we're talking about a full moon, like this example, the sun is going to be in the opposite part of the um, oval. We want to be able to interpolate between those two extremes, new moon, same place, full moon, opposite location, the next example that I'm going to have you try is going to be not simply a full moon, which means opposite, but recognizing that if it's lit up on the left, the sun will be on the left, and if it's lit up on the right, the sun will be on the right. Once we have drawn the sun in our picture, then it becomes very straightforward for us to determine clock time. First of all, it's below the horizon, so we know it's night, um, and second, it is past that lowest point, which means it's after midnight, but it is not yet above the horizon, so it's before sunrise. This example would probably be 3 a.m., after midnight, but before sunrise. So with all that in mind, and you can rewind if you want me to walk you through the steps again, but with that in mind, I want you to try answering what time of day we are looking at right at this moment on the new example. Pause the video and go through the steps in your notes. Draw this in your notes, then go through the steps. And then unpause it when you're ready for me to go through it. 
Okay, so we want to draw the path of the moon and the sun through the sky. We want to figure out where the sun would be. The sun is not going to be directly opposite because we are no longer talking about a full moon. Instead, we see a moon that is half lit up. We're going to get the sun halfway in between right next to and right across from. And because it's lit up on the left side, we're going to put it on the left um, halfway point of this, of this traveling. So now, based on the sun's location, we can see that, again, it is after midnight and before sunrise, and maybe we'll say 3 a.m. again, and that would be perfectly fine. If we compared our two pictures side by side, uh, we would see that this sun is a little bit further along than the previous one. So maybe this is 4 a.m. instead of 3 a.m., but both of those would be perfectly great answers. Really, any number that is... any time of day that is after midnight and before sunrise, you would have gone through the steps exactly as we'd hoped. So that works, that works great. If you really struggled with this, talk with me. I can come up with lots of other ways to try to describe these, talking about the steps in different ways or different things you might consider. So definitely ask for help if you need it. So to wrap up this section, this is the last slide for this um, video. We saw this beautiful picture, my favorite photo in all of humanity, Earthrise. And I want you to think about a couple of questions, just kind of really big picture questions. First of all, what would we name this Earth phase based on our waxing and waning idea uh, and our uh, crescent and gibbous shape names? And if you thought about it um, and maybe drew out a whole diagram, what moon phase would Earth be observing uh, if we're looking back at the moon? Now, you don't have to know the answer to the second one, uh, but I'm gonna, when I tell you, it's going to make hopefully some sense, and it's going to be then easy to answer that in general. So the Earth phase, if, if we are kind of oriented the way that we would expect for the moon, as if we're looking at the um, moon coming up the way that the, the Earth coming up the way the moon would for the Northern Hemisphere, this would be definitely a gibbous Earth, and probably we would call it a waxing gibbous Earth. So if this is a waxing gibbous Earth, the moon phase is going to be the opposite, a waning crescent moon. Now that opposite thing is always going to be true. If we were looking for a new moon, we would be standing on the day side of the Earth. So someone who is experiencing new moon would see a full Earth. And if we wanted to look at full moon, we would have to be standing on the nighttime side of the Earth. And so someone on the full moon would be experiencing the new Earth. They wouldn't be able to see the lit up part. The moon phase is always going to be exactly opposite the Earth. Uh, and if, if that doesn't make any sense. Drawing some diagrams might help, but again, that one's a little bit beyond our curriculum goals and just kind of a fun fact uh, in case you're, you're ever trying to picture the, the big ideas uh, around the Earth-Moon-Sun system. And the next video is going to be talking about cool things that happen in special situations with the Earth-Sun-Moon system. So I look forward to talking about eclipses with you in the next section. Thanks for watching.